Our text is the reading this day from book 5 of Moses. And the Lord thy God will put out those from before thee, little by little. It is difficult to say why Peter put the question to Jesus. Lord, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Did he try to remind Jesus of the sacrifice he had made? Did he want Jesus to notice that he had left behind a profitable fishing business to become a disciple? Or was Simon Peter implying that he deserved a greater reward than some guy who has had two heart attacks and comes to faith in the final hour of his life? Or was the man merely curious? Give the big fisherman credit for one thing. He asked the question that comes to every thinking person sooner or later. It is a question that you and I have wondered about too. Does the faith pay dividends? What's in it for me? If I do decide to go against the grain of this world and walk the straight and narrow, is our love and our labor for the Lord and for others worth it? Moses anticipates that question in the text before us today. He has charted for his people a difficult course to follow. He planted the flag on the peak of the hill and summoned his people to make the arduous climb. He called upon an unswerving allegiance to the Lord who loved them and set them free and led them this far. He warned them of prosperity and about the pressures that would come upon them from the pagan people among whom they lived. Religious, moral, social pressure to get them to compromise their faith. Now Moses goes on to tell them that it will be worth it if only they will do it. Wherefore, it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these commandments, to hear them and to do them, the Lord thy God will keep his covenant and his mercy, which he swear unto thy father. Don't worry about God letting you down. Don't think that the Lord will fail to keep his end of the bargain. God's arm has not grown short. He is able to keep renewing his promises to the fathers and to the sons. Century after century to a thousand generations. But that's his business. Your business is to hear the commandments and to keep them. To apply the word to your own heart. And put it into practice in your personal lives. And those of you who have committed yourself, who have taken seriously the following of the Lord your God, Moses goes on to say, and the Lord will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee, and will bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy field, thy cattle on the farm, thy sheep in the fold, he will multiply thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Just think of it. Any sacrifice you've ever done, God will repay you. He will surround your life with tokens of his loving kindness. He will crown the work of your hands with choicest blessings. He will multiply your numbers and then... Multiply the supplies you need to meet those numbers. Even more, the Lord will take away from you the sicknesses and the terrible diseases which you saw given to the Egyptians. And he will lay those diseases upon them that hate thee. We can only guess what terrible diseases fell upon the Egyptians 
the epidemic consequences of the ten plagues, the contamination of their drinking water, the filthy flies and the light, the festering boils on man and beast, the crop failure and the dirt storms and the famine. It is an astonishing thing when you think of it. But the blessings that the Lord promises are those which no man on earth can reproduce. We can reduce our numbers, prevent conception, but we cannot automatically increase those numbers. We can ruin our fields, pollute our rivers, cut back on our crop production, but there is no guarantee that we can improve them. We can combat disease with our pills and our potions, our antibiotics and exotic surgery, with regimens of diet and exercise, but we cannot prevent disease. We can form our life extension societies and take our life enhancement courses, but you cannot make life worth living, nor can anyone add to the three score years and ten, but God Almighty can. We cannot predict, much less control the weather. The jet stream that has given us the hot spell these past weeks. The issues of life and death are as mysterious and inexplainable today as they ever were. No governmental agency under the sun, no politician or environmental expert can guarantee you rainfall or fruitfulness of the womb or of the field, from the sky above or from the ground below, from plague or pestilence, from war or famine. But God Almighty can. He has. He will. Beautifully, the blessings He promises are not only for the favored few in this world, the high and the mighty and the wealthy and the powerful, the half-wit movie star or oil sheik with four yachts, six sports cars and a dozen different residences. The blessings God promises are for everyone. He lets all of you in on it. Moses realizes another question may come to mind. And if thou shalt say in thine heart, these nations are more and mightier than we are, we shall never be able to drive them out. And that is possible. Moses never fooled them about the enormity of the venture. He never painted their pilgrimage as a picnic. Moses took it for granted that only after the long and weary march you reach your promised rest. Only after the battles are fought are the battles won. Only after the ground is planted and plowed can the harvest be brought home. Only after the pain and sorrow of childbirth will the laughter of a little child ever ring in your home. But are the odds against you? Are the obstacles too weightily stacked on the other side? Don't you be afraid, Moses continued. Thou shalt not be afraid of them. The remedy for your fear is faith. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and Egypt. Don't you remember what you saw with your own eyes? 
the mighty signs and wonders, the outstretched arm and the mighty hand, and how the Lord brought you free. Don't you see? Every day of your life is to be an exodus out of Egypt, again in miniature. Look again to the same Lord. Still he sets his people free from the fear of death, from the tyranny of men, and from the oppressive bondage of sin in our lives. For the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty and a terrible God. Moses gives them no psychological pep talk. No little lecture on positive thinking or on self-confidence. Moses says your problem comes because you look too much at the odds in your life and too little to your Lord. Too much to the hostility of men and too little to the love of God. Too much to the storms that break over your little ship. And too little to the Lord, the ruler of wind and wave. Too much to the might of men. And too little to the strength of God. You're concentrating on your own weaknesses and inability. Instead of on the everlasting strength of the Lord your God. He will send the hornet among them. I'm not sure that word hornet is literal or symbolical or bold. He's speaking here of insects that sting and swarm and stampede you in panic. Or whether he's speaking of a psychological loss of concentration. If you've ever tried to hang a storm window with a hornet or a wasp buzzing about your ears, doggone hard to concentrate on that storm window. Moses always tells them the success of the venture is the Lord's doing. You can have your soldiers, but you won't win by military might, heroic action, or clever strategy. And nothing shows that better than the next promise in this chapter. And the Lord thy God will put out the nations from before thee, little by little. Israel didn't much go for that. They wanted it all at once. One gigantic campaign, victory, triumph. Then ease and comfort evermore. But it is the Lord's way to give to them little by little. As a mother does with her child. As a teacher does with a slow student. Not the whole confounded book. But one lesson, one step at a time. Otherwise. The land was too large to put under the plow. Their people were too few to inhabit the place. The thorns and the thistles and the wild beasts would have gotten the jump on them. They simply couldn't have handled the promised land all at one time. And isn't that the Lord's way with us as well? Little by little, patiently, slowly, giving us time to grow, to mature, to become seasoned, to handle our blessings. Possibly we need the seasons of loneliness. However else would you appreciate the life's partner God places at your side. We need the agonizing struggle. However else will we handle prosperity when it comes. And those hours of an overwhelming sense of unworthiness, 
How else will we ever take the righteousness that is from above, from God in Jesus Christ? You see it with your children. They always want the privileges without the responsibility. They want the lifestyle of the grown-up without first growing up. They want to begin where their parents have left off. They want the fruit of the years of labor without the years of labor. And what harm would come to them and to us if God were to give it all to us when we couldn't handle it? But he doesn't. Little by little is the Lord's way. And this last remarkable promise, the graven images of their God, thou shalt burn with fire, thou shalt not desire the silver, nor covet the gold. Ha! That's the true test of allegiance. Whether you are able to cast the gold and silver into the fire, whether you really believe that your blessings are bound up in the God who gives them. And Moses is saying, the blessings that God gives surpass anything you could ever buy with silver or gold. And that's what St. Paul said. God doesn't always give you what you want. But, quote, exceeding abundantly above anything you shall ask or desire. And isn't that how Jesus answered Simon Peter? Everyone that has forsaken land, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or houses, for my sake, I'll pay him back a hundredfold. And you shall inherit everlasting life. Amen.